I think most folks of a certain age have thought about making a video game at some point. I know I certainly have. Ever since I first played the likes of Pokemon Coliseum as a kid, I wanted to try my hand at making my own role-playing game. RPGs are a truly special genre, especially Japanese RPGs such as Dragon Quest and Grandia. And, as an 11-year-old in 2009 with no knowledge of game programming, who desperately wanted to make their own RPG, I found just the program to let me try to do so. This was RPG Maker XP. Originally released for Windows in 2004, this simple tool and game engine promised to allow me to make the RPG of my dreams. As long as said RPG was meant to be played only on PC and was done a retro art style, of course. XP was not the first nor the last version of RPG Maker, though. This is a series that has roots stretching back to the late 80s, and even had two new entries released this year. This is Retrospective, the series where I try to push off the rose-tinted glasses and take a critical look at games from my past. Today we're going to not only go through the history of RPG Maker, but also dive into both RPG Maker XP for PC and the soon-to-be-released version of RPG Maker MV for Nintendo Switch. In addition, we're also going to be looking at an attempt I had at making a Pokemon game from when I was a young preteen slash teenager. So with that, let's dive right into it. RPG Maker XP! First, create a setting map for the story as you envision it, using highly intuitive controls. RPG Maker XP! RPG Maker is the brainchild of the folks over at the ASCII Corporation in Japan. However, most entries weren't made by them. Rather, they are created by a company called Enterbrain. Oddly enough, the RPGM series are the only titles Enterbrain has worked on that I have any familiarity with. Each of these titles share similar qualities. There's usually a layered map-making system done with a drag-and-drop interface. There's usually either a front-facing Dragon Quest-style battle system or a side-view battle system built in. And, though there may be the ability to do some coding trickery and add custom graphics and music, there is always a very noticeable layer of constraints placed on the user. Which isn't necessarily a bad thing, as constraints often birth creative game design. The earliest versions of RPG Maker date back to the late 1980s, with versions being released for systems such as the PC-9801 line of computers, the Super Nintendo, and even a version for the original Game Boy. And, of course, being a text-heavy light game creation tool, I have no way to go back and play any of these and make any real progress. While there are several versions of the software released for PC throughout the 90s, RPG Maker's 95 and 2000 come to mind, the first version to gain any sort of traction outside of Japan was a title simply called RPG Maker for the original PlayStation. This featured many of the earlier mentioned features, though it was notorious for its clunky interface and massive save file sizes. Though, to be fair, what do you expect from software that's letting you make your own games? You can even make custom characters for your games using a tool called Anime Maker. Though, again, I have no experience with this. There were three major versions of RPG Maker released throughout the early 2000s. These were RPG Maker's 2003, XP, and VX. While I have no experience using 2003 and only limited experience playing around with VX, XP is where I sunk a massive chunk of my time. See, originally 11-year-old me was torn between getting RPG Maker's 03 or XP. Mainly this was based off the possibility of using either to make a Pokemon fan game. My lean towards getting 03 came after seeing a video from YouTuber Lethras showing off a Pokemon demo they had made and then abandoned. However, I ultimately went with XP. This was thanks in part to a fan-made Pokemon game engine for it called Flame Guru's Pokemon Starter Kit. This would later be known as Pokemon Essentials. But before we dive into my attempts at making a Pokemon fan game, let's take a look at RPG Maker XP itself. It's kind of crazy to think about how this is the same install of RMXP I had when I was a kid. If I remember right, I got my digital copy of it as a birthday gift for my mom. I think we had to purchase it direct from Enterbrain's website, though don't quote me on that. What's even crazier to think about is how RMXP feels even more intuitive now than ever before. No joke! 
Until making this video, I hadn't touched this program in nearly six years, and yet it feels even easier to grasp now than when I was a teen. RMXP is split into four main sections. Really, these are sections found in almost every version of RPG Maker, but XP is where I became familiar with them. First off, there's the left sidebar, which contains the towel palette with the map menu right underneath. Here you can create new maps, select which tiles they use, the default overworld and battle themes for each map, and from the tile palette, select which graphical tile you will place on the map screen. To the right of that is the actual map screen, which is divided into four layers. You can toggle through these using the top bar. Three of these layers are merely for making the map itself. This three layer approach means that you can overlay certain tiles on top of each other, creating an illusion of depth. It's also often good for organizational purposes. The fourth layer is special though. This is the event layer. Here you can make NPCs, create warps to other maps, and really create most things that could happen in RPG Town or Dungeon happen. Giving these events meaning is simple, with almost no knowledge of coding required. All you need to get the hang of here are drop down menus, and for the sake of making your game feel fleshed out, conditional branches and switches. Those latter things are basically just if-then statements, and that's just the tip of the iceberg, as with clever use of these you can do things such as make events that only happen on certain days of the week or create NPCs with massive trees of branching dialogue. Really, the possibilities are seemingly endless. The third of the main sections is the database. Here you can do things such as mess around with animations, how the battle system is laid out, and really most things that aren't related to the main game world. It seems like a lot, and that's because it is, but like most of the rest of RMXP, it's laid out in such a way that you could at least kind of get the hang of it in an afternoon. The most complex section though is the RGSS menu. Every version of RPG Maker from RMXP in 2004 up until RPG Maker VX Ace in 2011 contained an RGSS library. RGSS itself stands for Ruby Game Scripting System, which is a variant on the Ruby programming language. Enterbrain probably went with this language for RMXP due to the popularity Ruby had gained in Japan throughout the late 90s and early years of the new millennium. Messing around with RGSS is how you can do some real crazy stuff with the RMXP. But also, coding is something that can take time to learn, and for many folks, such as preteen me, it's something that you don't need to really understand to have fun with RMXP. Adding new graphical and sound assets is as simple as dragging files into the respective folders in your project files. However, if you're bringing in a new tile set, I do recommend making sure it's properly sized using Photoshop or something first. Really though, that's the gist of it. That's RMXP in brief. It's not the most powerful engine around, but it's easy to learn and really quite versatile. Of course, with that has come some stereotypes about RPG Maker games. Ask most RPG fans what they think about actual games made with RPG Maker, and you'll likely hear a few words thrown around. Cheap, low quality, barely playable, oh and don't forget about smutty. And while there are definitely a ton of RPG Maker games out there that fit the bill of cheap, low quality, barely playable smut, it's definitely wrong to say that all games made with RPG Maker fit that bill. If it weren't for RPG Maker, we would have never gone to the likes of The Witch's House, the original Corpse Party, or even incredible fan games such as Super Pokemon Eevee Edition. I especially recommend the latter of those, by the way. Spee is a ton of fun, and a must play for any fan of Pokemon or the PS1 era of Final Fantasy. But with that, I think it's time we move on from a good Pokemon fan game to a not so good Pokemon fan game. See, I didn't just want to make this video to compare RMXP with RPG Maker MV on Switch. No, I wanted to dig up something from my past. Something odd, something unique, something that makes me question if my teenage self was overly ambitious or just an idiot. And that something in question is this. Pokemon Cobalt Version. Well, to be fair, this here is technically Pokemon Cobalt Version, the unreleased demo that I let a couple of friends play. But yeah, that doesn't roll off the tongue as well. So what's the story behind this? Well, when I was but a wee preteen, I had two ideas in mind for RPGs I wanted to make. One was an Earthbound-esque adventure taking place in a stylized version of where I grew up in the American South. 
The other was a Pokemon game with semi-open world aspects, some overhauls to the gym challenge formula, and a graphical style reminiscent of Pokemon Gold and Silver versions. Oh, and there was also a region with Greek and Roman influences because damn, I was a queer kid, what else would you expect? This is where Pokemon Essentials comes in. The version of Essentials I used for my game had a few major standout features. It had a base graphical style reminiscent of the Game Boy Advance Pokemon games, a Pokemon battle system with abilities and moves that were up to date with Pokemon Diamond and Pearl on the DS, and even this really nifty editor feature. Really, the editor is the unsung hero of Pokemon Essentials. This thing allows you to easily add in trainers, connect maps to one another to make one big overworld, set Pokemon encounters in each area, and so, so, so much more that I could talk about for hours. Not only that, but despite the editor being a separate program from RMXP, the two can work in tandem, with a lot of the editor features being available from a debug menu that you can access when testing a game from within RMXP. Despite the ease of use though, the Pokemon Cobalt demo is pretty rough. I mean, first off, I imported all of the graphical assets for the sprites and overworld tiles into RMXP myself. That included revamping the battle system's aesthetic, but only kind of half-assedly so. I mean, just look at it. I also found and imported a Pokemon Gold and Silver style font for the game, but it looks rather blurry when used here and it doesn't line up with most of the menus. Honestly, the game looks better when played with the Ruby and Sapphire style font enabled and that just kind of clashes a bit with the aesthetic in my opinion. The biggest issue of the game here though, is balance. Why does the first gym leader have an Omanyte? Why does the Pichu in the first rival battle have zero damaging moves? And what's up with Route 2? See, Route 1 has no patches of tall grass where you can encounter wild Pokemon, and the only trainer encounter is the first rival battle. However, Route 2 is an absolute behemoth, and it's really just something that would be much better suited for later on in the game. I think it's actually much improved by taking down some of the impassable patches of trees. This makes it both easier to go through, and also makes some of the previously mandatory areas optional. Besides the weirdness with Route 2, the overworld map design is the only thing I'll actually give younger me some props on. I think it has something to do with how I laid out trees and buildings in the few playable routes and towns here. See, instead of lining them up in rows like in the main games, I staggered them all slightly, which I felt would make each area feel a bit more natural and lived in. And as an adult, I agree. The towns and routes here definitely feel unique, even if still very much so feeling at home in a Pokemon game. I can't give props to much else though. Well, maybe except for the second gym, in which you have to use switches to lower the water level on the platform the gym leader is standing on. The plot for the game as I remember it involves you being a 10 year old kid living in the region of Pauline, who's been called by Professor Oak to come get a Pokemon for his birthday. These Pokemon, in the demo anyways, are Bulbasaur, Squirtle, and Charmander. However, I do remember that I was planning to switch them over to just being an Eevee at some point. Anyways, along the way you do regular battle with an awfully rude rival and take on the evil Team Rocket, who steals a special stone from your uncle that was a family heirloom of sorts. Where this plot majorly differs from the Gen 1 Pokemon games is that it's set 20 years BEFORE the original games. I didn't really do much with this though. I think this was just a convenient way of explaining why there's a lack of a Pokedex. It also explains why there's two Professor Oaks in this story. See, one is an older professor who is old enough to likely be dead by the time Pokemon Red and Blue versions happen, and the other is his son, a university professor here who is the Professor Oak you know and love. See, the older one is his dad. It also ends up that the stolen heirloom contains a mythical Pokemon inside of it, and Team Rocket has wanted to kidnap the regional president's daughter and literally hold the largest city in the region hostage because they're evil and want money and are taking part in a story originally written by a literal 11 year old. Where I really feel I bit off more than I could chew here comes in regards to the story progression. After the small island where you start off on, which contains the first three routes, two gems, and an abandoned mine, the game was meant to open up more. You take a ferry to Cyan City, and then immediately cross into an area containing two more dungeons, three routes, and another town, all of which comprises a massive desert. The idea was that, at this point, gyms would open up to be taken on in almost any order you wanted, with trainer level scaling based on the number of obtained badges. This would also affect things such as when certain story events would happen, and also when certain optional dungeons would become explorable. There were also plans to add several new Pokemon, based off scrap designs from Pokemon Gold and Silver versions, and also new forms for old Pokemon, also based off of beta designs. 
Of these, only two of these beta designs were ever actually added to the game. One was Kurusu, a mythical ice-type Pokemon whose design was originally scrapped from gold and silver versions. The other is Lapras here, based off its beta design from the original Pokemon games. I remember Beta Lapras actually being one of the last things I added to Cobalt. It was also actually the first ever piece of art I ever commissioned. You can tell I didn't make this one. It's why Beta Lapras' sprite looks way better than that of Kurusu. This game was also going to contain 12 gems instead of the usual 8, and the later gem challenges were intended to be made into actual gimmicky challenges. The whole game would culminate in a huge tournament at the end, which would include gym leader rematches. The last major work I did in the game was in mid-2013. That was the same year Pokemon X and Y came out in the 3DS, by the way. By that time, I was in high school, and I had more important things on my mind than working on a project that, even if completed, I'd never be able to sell. As is, I only managed to get most of three gyms, four towns, and a few dungeons up and mostly playable. I could definitely see the map design balance get better over time as I played through the demo, but I could also see my interests evolve as well. One town features a Final Fantasy style inn where you can go to heal up, some routes feature weather that changes depending on the day and time, and perhaps funniest of all, the demo ends with a coffee break scene that seems almost completely ripped out of Earthbound. Before making this video, the last time I'd opened up the Cobalt game files was in 2014. I know this because these were the dates on the files themselves. If I remember right, I was bored and wanted to show a guy I was with at the time this weird Pokemon game I'd tried to make. And, if I remember right, we both laughed at the weird difficulty spikes and other odd quirks, such as most of the music being from the Pokemon trading card Game Boy games. I'd moved on from working on fan projects like this, and most of my supposed big ideas would be done in later, actual Pokemon games. And of course, the execution there would be much more competent. New forms for old Pokemon would arrive thanks to Mega Evolutions in Pokemon X and Y, a major revamp to the old gym formula would come thanks to the Island Challenge in Pokemon Sun and Moon, and, as for a major endgame tournament, that would be a major part of Pokemon Sword and Shield. The only thing we've still yet to see in an official mainline Pokemon game is the ability to take on gyms in almost any order. But then again, the fan-made ROM hack Pokemon Crystal Clear version exists, which allows you to do just that with the world of Pokemon Gold, Silver, and Crystal versions. I won't be releasing the Cobalt files here due to them being rough and also not wanting to incur Nintendo's wrath. So if you must play any Pokemon game after watching this, definitely try out Crystal Clear. Or, you know, you could try out RPG Maker MV instead, which will be out very soon on Nintendo Switch. Full disclosure before we go on, I was sent an advanced review copy of RPG Maker MV on Nintendo Switch by NIS America. RMMV was originally released for PCs back in 2015, with NIS America publishing PS4 and Switch versions, which will land on the 8th of September 2020. This isn't NIS's first time publishing an RPG Maker title either. They previously published RPG Maker FES for the 3DS. I never played that one, and really, prior to making this video, I had absolutely no experience with any version of RPG Maker past RPG Maker VX. I should also mention that RPG Maker MV itself is no longer the newest entry in the series. Only a couple of weeks ago, a new version was released for PCs called RPG Maker MZ. Apparently MZ is mostly just an updated MV, but I'm not sure as I couldn't be bothered to buy either of those for this video, as both of those retail for around $90 each up here. Seriously, why is there only a $3 price difference between these two on Steam? By the way, for those curious, the Switch version here is only going to be around $60 up here at launch, and it even has a physical release! Of course, it's also a bit different from what I've seen of its PC counterpart, but we'll get into that. RPG Maker MV on Switch starts with something that I feel all versions of RPG Maker should have. A tutorial. Seriously, this tutorial isn't too long and it covers all the basics, and it really does allow you to get the gist of what RMMV is about. I'm also honestly surprised at how well the controls translate to a controller. RPG Maker is definitely still best enjoyed using a mouse and keyboard, but using Joy-Cons here wasn't bad at all. All the button mappings make sense to me, and I had no problem jumping right into MV after spending a week in toying around with XP again. There are two major differences here with how map layers and game sharing are handled. 
Instead of the actual map being divided into three layers for tiles, the actual tile set palette is divided into layers. I'm not sure how I feel about this, as I feel it limits what can be done with certain tiles a bit, but I can also see how this arguably makes RPG Maker just that much easier to get into. As for sharing, games can actually be uploaded to a place called the Maker Forum. Think of it like sharing levels in Mario Maker, except instead of Mario levels, you're sharing potentially completely fleshed out RPGs. There's actually something kind of similar to this for the PC version of RPG Maker. Uh, it's really cool because with that version, you can actually earn real money for your creations. It's called Steam. Snark aside though, I do actually like the Maker Forum. I was only able to try it out in a limited capacity as a Switch version of MV isn't out yet at the making of this video, but I think it actually is a pretty cool addition here. I also think that, due to the portable nature of the Switch, this version of RPG Maker will lend itself particularly well to creating bite-sized RPG adventures. The possibilities here too are endless. It's a shame then that RMMV on Switch is held back by a few glaring flaws. First off is the touch control implementation. RPG Maker just seems like something that'd work incredibly well with touch controls. And though it works fine with a Joy-Con, using a finger to drag and drop just seems like an intuitive step forward for those of us used to using a mouse with RPG Maker. However, there is no way to resize icons here, which sucks as they're rather tiny. I wanted to love using RPG Maker in handheld mode. I thought using my fingers to create maps would be awesome, but as is, icons and assets are just too small. I was fat fingering icons and having to undo more mistakes in handheld mode than I was doing any actual RPG making. There's also some weird load times. The game freezes up for a bit in between switching maps to edit, and the first time I downloaded a title from the Maker forums, the download seemed to freeze at one point for a good few minutes. It should also be mentioned that the PC version of MV got rid of the RGSS library in favor of a JavaScript based one, which definitely makes it just that much more accessible. However, there is no coding menu in the Switch version of MV, which definitely limits stuff a bit. Also note that there is no way to easily import custom graphics and music like in the PC version, and thanks to delays, this is a Switch port of what is no longer the newest version of RPG Maker. But at the same time though, I had an absolute blast just toying around with RPG Maker MV on Switch. I mean, at its core, it's still RPG Maker. Really, if you have any interest in making RPGs on your own, whether they be fan games, massive original adventures you can sell online, or just bite-sized quests you can send your friends, I'd recommend giving most versions of RPG Maker out there on Steam a try. If you insist on having the absolute latest and greatest with all the newest updates, then perhaps plunk down the 90 bones for MZ. But if you're on a budget and want something tried and true, then I'd recommend picking up RMXP, as that's also on Steam now. But what about RPG Maker MV on Switch? Well, if you love titles such as Super Mario Maker but want something that lets you do a good bit more, then absolutely pick it up. If you have just a Switch on hand and want to learn the basics of game making, then also definitely look into it. But for those who have just a passing interest in game creation, or who already have a PC version of RPG Maker on hand, then either pass it up or wait until it goes on sale. On the whole though, it's still RPG Maker. And I love it. RPG Maker's a series that really is timeless. So with that, that's it for the first episode of Retrospective. What games from the past should I look at in the future? What are your memories with RPG Maker if you have any? Let me know in the comments down below. And while you're at it, subscribe to Stuff We Play for more great content like this. Stuff We Play is also proudly supported in part by our YouTube channel members and our patrons on Patreon. Their support means the world, and every dollar earned from those platforms goes into making the channel better. This has been Retrospective. Thank you very much for watching. Stay classy, and I'll see you next time.